Okay. Okay. Great sorry day. about that. Okay. okay. Bye. bye. We are here at the United Nations being celebrated in 144 countries around the world. I believe that women are better business people than men. So how would that be with these young women who have education? When women entrepreneurs take risks and succeed, societies change for the better. It becomes easier to accept the idea of a woman as the family's breadwinner, the head of a household, a community leader, or a head of state. We need women to have more access to capital. We need women to have better leadership opportunities. And we need women to become entrepreneurs because if they become entrepreneurs, the whole world is going to change. Nowadays, people should not depend on employment is not there. So women creating their own entrepreneurship and employment is a very important thing and that's dear to me. You've got turtle day, you've got bubble bath day. These are real days in the world. So I thought, you know what, let's do Women's Entrepreneurship Day. Let's bring awareness to the fact that we need to empower, celebrate and support women. Women more than any other human being work so hard for their dreams that if you want to invest in the future of the world, you have to invest in women. Hello, Hawaii. I'm Katie Chin, the U.S. Women's yeah, Entrepreneurship so. Day yeah, Regional you. Ambassador, sending you best wishes, wishes and congratulations from Los Angeles. As a chef and daughter of one of Minnesota's first Asian American women entrepreneurs, I look forward to tonight's amazing discussion. I also wanted to thank uh, Melanie Kosaka for being Hawaii's amazing Women's Entrepreneurship Day ambassador. We're here to make a change, to inspire, to motivate, and especially celebrate Women's Entrepreneurship Day. Have an amazing night, everyone. Mahalo, Katie. Welcome everyone and welcome right, First Lady Dawn Ige. I'm Leela Bilmes Goldstein, Executive Ige, Director of Women's Fund of Hawaii, Yoko and we are delighted to be part of Women's, Women's Entrepreneurship Hawaii. Day Hawaii 2020. 2020. Our mission at Women's Fund of Hawaii is to support Women's innovative Hawaii. grassroots programs that empower Women's women and girls across the state of Hawaii. We believe in abundant, vibrant, and flourishing communities that exist because women and girls thrive. Part of that involves identifying and investing in programs that develop leadership and economic pathways for women. Women start businesses at twice the rate of men, but are funded at vastly lower rates. Meanwhile, research shows that if female entrepreneurs received the same amount of support as their male counterparts, the global economy could experience a boost of up to $5 trillion. Research also shows that women-led businesses experience more positive outcomes and sometimes outperform their peers and competitors. So tonight, I'm pleased that Takaho Iwasaki and Melanie Kosaka will be speaking with two female grassroots entrepreneurs making a difference island style. Donna Shapiro of the Hawaii Ulu Cooperative 
and Lena Sakai of Furman Station Company in Japan. But before we start the conversation, it is my pleasure to welcome Consul General Aoki of the Japanese Consulate in Honolulu. Aloha, everyone. It is a pleasure to join all of you today. The Consulate General of Japan is honored to co-organize this event as a part of Women's Entrepreneurship Day. As they say, Women's Entrepreneurship Day is every day. The Japanese government believes that women's advancement is a great source of vitality for the world, bringing the diverse perspective and uh, integrity uh, to the economy and to the society as a whole. Especially now, in the light of our challenging uh, challenges surrounding COVID-19, we are still, uh, we are all finding ourselves uh, having to acclimate to a new normal. This means, among other things, inventing new communities and services. Given the <coughs> current state of Hawaii economic landscape, it is imperative that we think of new businesses which will enable these islands to thrive. Agriculture has been uh, touted as one of the most feasible candidates to become a major industry that can sustain Hawaii in the future. Today's program featuring Ms. Lina Sakai and Ms. Dana Shanson Shapio uh, will talk about new agricultural business models. Therefore, is very timely one for us. I'm looking forward to joining all of you this evening to learn more about what uh, they have been enduring in in their respective businesses. Thank you and mahalo. We are so appreciative of your support to bring together women entrepreneurs from Japan and Hawaii. Um, Takaho and I are here at the Box Jelly with Dana Shapiro of Hawaii Ulu Cooperative. And joining us from Japan is Lina Sakai of Furman Station. Thank you, Melanie. Lina is the founder and the CEO of the one of the only companies that produces organic ethanol from agriculture waste and the food waste. Thank you, Lina, for joining us. Hi, Lina. Hi, Lina. Good. One of the things we wanted to talk about first is because both Lena and Donna are from island communities that is maybe um, during this situation with the pandemic, there are opportunities and a silver lining from looking at things from a global scale to a more local scale. Dana, why don't you? What is that? Oh, well, let's see. Um, I think during the pandemic, it heightened um, the awareness of many in our local community throughout Hawaii of the importance of increasing our self-sufficiency, especially in food. Um, we import 85 to 90 percent of our food and virtually 100 percent of our staple foods, which represent over half of our daily caloric needs. Um, and so I think people started to really pay more attention to that um, precarious situation that really threatens us every day, but the pandemic forced us all to see it in a new light. Um, and so that's certainly one silver lining. Um, for us, it also forced us to look to our local community for a market uh, after much of our market was displaced because of the lack of tourism. Um, and that's another silver lining because it, it enabled us, um, I guess, forced us to really build stronger relationships with our local community. One of the things that I wanted to ask you was how did the, co the idea for the Ulu Co-op start? Well, it was formed in August of 2016. So we're just over four years old. Um, and it really grew out of um, a farm that my husband and I founded in 2015, which is an breadfruit restoration agroforest in South Kona, which used to have an expansive agroforest pre-contact that produced um, about 40 million pounds of food a year. Um, by comparison, Hawaii today produces maybe 150,000 pounds of breadfruit, um, so much more than we produce today. Um, and we started looking around once we had our farm and realized that there were 
a lot of small breadfruit farms that were just starting like us, and we could achieve so much more if we pooled our resources, aggregated our fruit, and built economies of scale much faster than any of us alone could. And that was really the beginning. And you have some amazing farmers that are part of the co-op. And thank you for bringing a video that we could share to watch and learn a little bit of what we can't make it to the Hawaii Island, but we'd love to see the video. So if you want to tell us a little bit about that and we'll play it. Sure. So um, I believe this is the Meet the Farmers video. Yes. And it was actually developed for school children to teach them about the um, burgeoning breadfruit industry in Hawaii and to help foster connections between school kids and farmers directly, recognizing that most kids, especially now during the pandemic, might not be able to go out to a farm and see where their ulu is grown. I think our video is just about to play. Our farmers are small scale. 96% of Hawaii's farmers have gross revenues of under $250,000 a year and virtually all our farmers fit into that category. Our farmers are geographically diverse. They're located in every district of the Big Island. Our farmers are united by their passion for ulu and their commitment to improving our community and the future of Hawaii for the next generation. We're really passionate about keeping agricultural lands, specifically in Kohala as agriculture, keep the land productive and to keep it in good hands being part of a co-op that's also looking to sustain agriculture throughout the state as well as be able to provide a nutritious staple is something that we thought was worthwhile and we're interested in putting our best foot forward in order to be a part of that. What I, I love about ULU is people's enthusiasm for ULU. People have a story, childhood story, or what can I do to incorporate it? And that's an awesome moment. I would call this farm a canoe farm. It's the kind of food that people have been eating for thousands of years, like cassava and kalo, and bananas. Bananas produce more weight per acre than any crop on the planet. Ooh, number two. Ooh produces a lot of food. And it's something that I can eat every day of my life and be totally content. I grew up down here in Kalapana. I would say about like four or five generations on this aina over here. I grew up on Ulu. That's what we had on our table almost every night. We can supply ourselves over here. We don't need outside help. We know how to live over here in the islands. Ulu is better than, you know, potatoes and rice. It's natural here. It's grown locally on the island and it grows good and it tastes good. <laughs> it's awesome to put the ulu into the schools because, you know, we have so much on this island, you know. Why are we bringing in other stuff from the outside when the kids can have good nutrition, solid, you know, food for them and it comes right from the aina over here. Once you eat ulu on a beach, cooked in the fire, under the stars, you never look back. I use a tried and tested recipe of fresh ulu salad, which is always highly requested now for when I'm taking something to a gathering. Baked, boiled, boiled, fried. fried. He bakes it when it's ripe. He, he takes out the seed the stem and he puts butter in it and puts it in the oven. It's like eating a potato but this one is better. Sweet. I like to eat them as poi and um, ulu fries and I like the hummus. I'm just so appreciative of the co-op. It's an amazing thing because it gives me as a farmer and other farmers inspiration and an outlet for all of our work. It's going out there, it's going to the school, into the hotels and, and different accounts that the Ulu Co-op has. 
which I would never be able to do. I'm just a farmer, you know. So to have a co-op, it's a big part of the other half of having a tool or two, because I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have a market for it. I think the future of Ulu and Hawaii is promising. We have a really strong co-op and we have a good team of managers and employees and board members and farmers. And I think that's where it starts, right? You have the people that are invested in it and see it as having the potential. And being part of a cooperative is something that is exciting because you're not farming just for yourself, right? You're farming for the well-being of an organization, for the well-being of your other farmers. And you see this beautiful tree that you can walk out in your yard and pick this fruit and bring it into your kitchen to eat it. There's a feeling inside you you don't get from doing anything else. It's very, very special. Yeah, Keikis, eat you guys Ulu is good for you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dana, for sharing the video. Next, I introduce Lena as a counterpart in Japan, who is also working to um, restore and revitalize the community through the agriculture. Lena has a financial background working at the Fuji Bank and the Doshi Bank for 10 years, and then going to agriculture businesses uh, from the experience she's working in a joint venture in when she was university. Before that, she joined the Agri Tokyo Agriculture University to learn the agriculture and the fermentation. I really admire her because she is a powerful entrepreneur who can pursue the business profit and the uh, business profit. And while she's pursuing the business profit, she can successfully sustain, uh, she can successfully pursue the sustainability in agriculture and food businesses. Lina, so my first question is uh, why is there a need to convert food waste and the rice fuel in the, into the ethanol? You. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, finally. Yes, I'm muted. Hello, I'm Lena from from station. Sorry. A little bit why you decided to do convert the food to ethanol. Okay, thank you. Um, let me briefly explain what's going on in Japan. You know, I'm sure you all know that Japanese people eat lots of lots of rice. But actually, you know, the number of population is decreasing and we eat lots of pasta, bread and stuff. So the consumption of rice has been decreasing dramatically. And actually right now, one third of rice paddy in Japan is not being utilized. It's been sometimes deserted. It looks like forest. Or sometimes um, farmers are um, asked to, to make something else like beans and stuff. So um, in a way to keep revenue for rice farmers and also to keep the environment, we have to find better way to make you good use of the rice field. So that was, um, and many people have lots of ideas like to use rice for um, like sake, crackers and sometimes feed. And one of our idea was to make alcohol and um, ethanol from rice. And using that technology, we realized that we can use, um, we can also use like food waste, such as like apple residue or the, the banana peels and stuff. So that's what we are doing right now. Yeah, I didn't know the rice is actually, some of the rice is wasted. And then as you said, it's like rice is not only the waste of waste food in agriculture, there's any other those waste resources that can be converted to the ethanol? Yeah, um, actually rice is being utilized. It's rice field that's not being utilized. So um, what we do, we, 
we revitalize the the deserted rice um, rice paddy and make it into the rice paddy that we can use and ask the farmers to grow rice. And there are lots of lots of other stuff as well, um, the food waste, or um, we tend to like the material that contains lots of sugar, starch, and uh, leftover from like juice or um, the extract from peas and stuff like that. Thank you very much. Lena, one question I had that I thought was really interesting is you talked about being able to trace back the ethanol that's made to organic rice fields. And I haven't heard about that before, if it's something you could expand on a little bit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for actually, when we first started a business, we were thinking of using the ethanol alcohol for biofuel. But it turned out that, that there is no way we can make money. It costs too much. But then looking back um, of what ethanol is, I realized that it's being used for cosmetics and like shampoos and conditioners and perfumes and even drinks. And it's something that we use every day. And I was looking back lots of that, like back of the, the label and realized it doesn't say where it comes from. So I thought, you know, for food, people always ask where it comes from. But when it comes to ethanol, because it's so common and it's something that we use every day, nobody cares about where it comes from. So I thought maybe we might be able to do business if we can tell exactly where it comes from. And right now, I, I have never seen any other alcohol that's 100% traceable. So we think it's the word only. So we can always tell you where the rice field is and when we ferment it, when we distill, we can even tell you when we pick the weeds and stuff. And also I thought um, because we were not using any agrochemicals, it, it's better if we can say it's organic. So we got the, the certification for rice and also the alcohol. So it's really rare to have the organic certificate um, for alcohol itself as well. Reception been like in Japan to um, having a product that's um, organic and certified. In Japan, I think alcohol is the only one that has organic certification. Is there any good, um, those products or agriculture resources that you can maybe possibly convert to the ethanol and make it as a very successful business in Hawaii? Yes, I love to. Um, <laughs> and, I was thinking that um, there are many materials like, but I'm sure you make lots of like pineapple juice and I'm assuming there might be the, the residue um, coming from that as well. Or, um, or Udu, I'm not sure, but. <laughs> we can still research it. Any, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really interested. Dana, you use the whole fruit from the skin to making flour. Can you tell us about some of the products? Yeah, so um, we have also very high production costs. Um, we pay our farmers a dollar a pound. We really try not to go below that because it's a lot of work to pick ulu. It's not easy. It takes time. Um, and we're all farmers, so we understand how much effort that takes. Um, and then all the way up to the wages that we pay our, our processing workers, um, which it starts at $14 an hour and goes up from there. So I think cost of doing business in Hawaii is really high, period. And that makes it challenging for all manufacturing. Um, I can only assume it's similar in Japan. Um, so one of the things that we've sort of had to do is be very resourceful with what materials we do have available to us. And um, the other, um, reason that we've really diversified our product line to use all the parts of the fruit is that ulu ripens really quickly. Um, sometimes within 24 hours of harvesting, depending on when it was harvested and the temperature of storage, it can ripen. Um, so if you're only making one product out of firm mature fruit, you're going to lose a lot of your yield. Um, so we've developed, um, as you said, Melanie, um, I think you mentioned a line of frozen cuts, but we have different maturity stages in the different frozen cuts. We also have an ulu chocolate mousse, which is a non-dairy frozen dessert. 
um, using the ripe fruit. And we have um, hummus, which is blended from the mature fruit, but sort of the off-grade fruit. And then our most recent product is our flower line. So we have just the flesh, so it's peeled and cored, um, very white, pretty flower. Um, and then we have a whole fruit flower, which is more like your whole wheat flour. And that's made with literally the whole fruit. It has speckles of brown, it's higher in fiber. Um, but we also work with Maona Community Garden, which is a local community garden near the facility. And they actually pick up all of our processing byproduct every day we have a shift. And they compost it using um, worms, so it's vermicompost. And they use that to build soil in a region of South Kona that has very young volcanic soil. Um, mostly rock. So it's really hard for farmers to actually need soil in that region. So they're converting the processing byproduct into soil. So that's been great. It's not been um, uh, monetized yet. Uh, we've been exploring how to kind of commercialize the composting operation so that we can then sell the compost, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, so hopefully with the scale of the operation, the scale of the compost will also become economical. Your background is you used to um, do consulting to help farmers and co-ops um, do well. Do you see that the model moving forward is you would have to not just be a co-op with members selling a product, but you really need to have a use all parts of the product and have sort of a whole line of uses to make it scalable in Hawaii? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure that I would say that universally, uh -huh. um, but the more you can sort of generate value out of the raw material, you know, the more opportunities you have for greater revenues, but also revenue diversification, which the pandemic's really highlighted is critical that you don't right. put all your eggs in one basket because you just don't know what's going to happen. It's interesting that both you and Lena, your businesses started with sort of an idea to restore and revive um, traditional crops, but it's had a very positive impact on the community. Um, Lena, maybe you can share some of what's happening in Japan. Yeah, uh, what's happening in my case? Or um, to give them a new market for the fallow rice fields? Okay, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, well, what happened to us is first we started to make use of the rice field. So we put, um, we asked farmers to grow rice and, and we ferment and made alcohol and realized there's no way we can make money if it's sell it for biofuel. So we came up with this idea to put, um, add more values. So our alcohol, this, we are selling like um, $200 per liter. It's really expensive. It's like more than 100, 200 times of the conventional alcohol, but it tells where it comes from and what year we harvested. It's like really premium wine. And also uh, we started to sell like uh, the hands play sell, telling that we are using the traceable alcohol. But that's not just it. You know, when we ferment and make alcohol, there's always a residue. And the residue is used as a feed for hen. And that because the food was really good, the hen started to make lot really good eggs. And that the hen farmer could also add value to it, saying that this egg is coming, is coming from the, the circular economy type of a business. And also um, the people who like the eggs so much, like um, other farmers started to make cookies and cakes and saying like sustainable cookies and cakes. And also um, because the, the residue hen are eating is so good, it's good for the, the stomach and the, the poops became really good fertilizer. So other farmers started to use as a fertilizer and they're growing a really good rice and tomatoes and green peppers. And we even started to grow um, sunflower and made oil from it. So as you can see, there's a lot of, lots of business going on and people started to notice about us and we started to be appear on media and people started to come. So we organized like a nonprofit organization to promote um, people to come visit us and buy local foods. And we started to do the, the local community tour. 
which resulted in invite more and more people, even from like the states or um, China, giving diversity to the the small community. So that's the what was the question? Am I answering okay? I think you did. Yeah. <laughs> it makes uh, all farmers happy. Yes, <laughs> not yes. only one farmer. Yeah. Only one farmer. <laughs> so, has that been part of what's been most rewarding is to be able to help a community and work with a community? Yes, um, that's something that we appreciate. We love so much. Um, you know, I'm from Tokyo Metropolitan and never had been visited like really countryside. But now they're like my family and my kids love them so much. And it's good to have the, the good connection to the community. So it's not actually it's not giving us much money, <laughs> revenue from that kind of like other business. But um, still, we think uh, for Farmer Station, we think it's really important and we enjoy it so much. How about from your side, Donna? Well, our um, as a co-op model, we are community owned. Yeah. So it's really um, sort of an intrinsic part of the whole business model that it is um, entrenched in the community and about uplifting, you know, from a very um, bottom up way, um, the, the bottom of the, the food value chain, which is the farmers, right? Um, and our mission is to revitalize fulu, breadfruit, as a viable crop and dietary staple for Hawaii. So our vision is to see it, you know, flourishing in many different forms, not just in the co-op. You know, we, we envision every restaurant serving fulu in some way, lots of value-added processors, you know, school kids growing up with it um, and loving it. Um, and so that really necessitates um, sort of a ripple effect all the way through the community. So yeah, it's very gratifying to see that start to happen. I think there has been momentum around Lulu, um, getting greater awareness in the general public, and that's really what we're focusing on. It could be the replacement for the potato that we import. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the things in terms of, it was a really great story that Kamehameha Schools gave you a small grant six years ago, five years ago, and um, access to some land and that has really amplified and helped your business and started the co-op. Are there things in government that can be done to support a more sustainable future? Absolutely. Um, the Mahi I Matchup program, which you referenced, um, where Kamehameha Schools awarded um, five-year free leases and some startup I mean, that's a great example of sort of a small um, hand up that can have a huge impact, not just for those that the awardees, but for their whole community. Right. Um, you know, the co-op itself has capitalized its growth through grant funds, mostly government grant funds, um, largely from the USDA. Um, and so I think that those sorts of programs are really essential for these business models that are unconventional and sort of progressive. Um, for co-ops, we don't actually qualify for conventional financing from banks, for instance. Um, there's a lot of issues with that, and there's not that many co-ops in Hawaii. So many lending institutions don't even really understand what it is. So these alternative financing mechanisms from government or foundations are critical. Yeah. So, Dana, so Hawaii is island, Japan's island. So the business type and how we are skilled in the business is a little bit have to be different mm -hmm. uh, from the way that in the constitute. Uh, what do you think um, the, the business in Ireland has to be scaled differently? And uh, what is the challenging, what's the opportunity? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think this might be a little different in Japan, but for us here in Hawaii, we really lack manufacturing capacity. Mm -hmm. There's not many large scale manufacturers so for us, if we were formed in California, for instance, we probably wouldn't have had to build our own factory. We would have probably right. been able to find a co-packer or rent space in an existing factory. In our case, there was none that existed. Um, 
So that's one big um, challenge that we face. Um, but I think there's also, again, that there is there is greater need to at least have a base level of self-sufficiency, um, and that is being more recognized today. So um, while there are challenges, I, I do see opportunities um, and more awareness of the importance of building, you know, circular economies, um, basic manufacturing capacity, all those things. How about you, um, Lina? Um, how how do you think about in Japan? Japan is the little bigger size, but it's also island. Uh, we call it a Shimaguni. Uh, what, what do you think was this challenging and the opportunity in Japan to scale your business? Um, first, in general, um, compared from maybe like other countries, Japan still, though the number of population is decreasing, still we have lots of um, population. So maybe we can say there's um, the, some size of market in Japan, but, but it, to really be scale and um, to grow our business and also to tell about us, to be known about us, I, we think that the Japan is not enough. So, um, you know, in Japan, many like mentors and advisors tell us that first you should focus on the Japanese market. And, and when you succeed, you should think about like going grow. But I feel it's too late. So, um, especially in my field, like um, the, the beauty and the clean beauty and the circular economy and the sustainable type of concept. I really feel that the Japanese market is not, it's too small or the, the perception is not enough. <laughs> there is not, um, I, I don't know, but I have a feeling that there's um, the other market, maybe in the States or in Europe who appreciate more about what we do. So I'm trying to be global from day one. Thank Am I answering you. okay? Has, um, one of the questions I was wondering with the pandemic and our use of hand sanitizer, has that opened up a market for you? Yes, um, the, the pandemic gave us um, both um, the, both positive impact and negative impact. And um, for the the first one, yeah, suddenly people start to talk about like sanitizers and the need for alcohol. But um, so our sales grew and also our manufacturing um, capacity. Uh, we actually, we made eight times more from last year. <laughs> meaning, meaning um, it, it doesn't mean we are really we grow, but maybe it means we were not doing enough at all. <laughs> Before that, actually, we didn't know how much we can make. You know, we even didn't know our ma maximum capacity. So that's something that we learned. That was good, but um, um, but still, we were thinking that you know, because people use sanitizer every day, people start to care more about where it comes from or what it is, but actually it didn't happen much because, you know, you don't really have a choice, right? I'm sure you use sanitizers every day, but I don't think many of you will look back and think about, oh, what is it made of? The answer can be like petrochemical or it might be sugar, sugar cane or corn, but you don't know. So um, the, the people's awareness haven't changed, but we can make a good start. So that was good. And, and also, um, yeah, that, that, that's the impression, but we are trying. And also but, yeah. in Japan, in, in, you know, in Japan, 99.9% um, 90, 90, 90, or maybe more of alcohol is being imported. And almost nobody is making um, alcohol domestically in Japan. So, um, that pandemic made us realize that, you know, alcohol might be something that's really important. And so I think it's good that at least we know um, how to make it. And we might be able to um, provide technology in the future, not just in Japan, but in like um, other countries too, because our technology um, uses really small um, machine. It doesn't require too much capex and not too much money. So we might be able to provide a technology 
to the maybe rural community so that people can make their own alcohol to be safe. How about you, Dana? I'm pretty sure you have both positive and negative impact. Definitely, yeah. Um, yeah, when the pandemic hit here in mid-March, we lost um, almost all of our sales very rapidly. It was almost overnight. It was like within one week, 95% of our sales just stopped. Um, because pre-pandemic, we were almost completely reliant on food service. Um, the Department of Education was our biggest single customer, and then we had lots of restaurants and hotels. Um, and with schools closing and tourists not coming, restaurants closing, that all stopped. So that was pretty traumatic, um, but we pivoted um, as hard as we could into direct-to-consumer e-commerce. Um, we made our website live, and we also um, cultivated a lot of new partnerships with the community, and we've been supplying um, many of the community feeding programs um, that have been um, growing in order to address food insecurity in Hawaii. So that's that's been our silver lining, again, is just connecting more with the local community and seeing so many more individual households putting ulu on the table, which I think has a bigger impact on changing dietary behavior than having even one big restaurant serving it to, you know, a bunch of tourists that come and go. So. I know we have some questions um, from the audience, and we are hopefully to get it shortly, we will. Um, question is, does rice, this is for Lena, um, does rice need to be replanted each season or is it a perennial? And um, in Japan, why don't they convert rice fields to other crops? Okay, and first, rice is something that you got to plant every year so we do the same thing we go, we have seeds and and put in water and plant it in may and harvest in um in autumn so that's what we do every year and the reason um they don't convert rice to other crops um actually they're doing it um like soybeans or wheat but um because they've been focusing on rice so much they don't it it's they gotta do something else, you know, they gotta purchase other equipment, other big machines and, you know, planter and harvester, all the machines are different and it costs really expensive. And it also they have to other way to um, other like route to the people to buy them. So rice for rice farmers, it's far easier to keep on growing rice using the, the machine that they have and doing the, the same thing every year. So, and there's so many rice fields that they don't use now. So some are being used for soybeans, but still, because there's so much, we, it's, it's better that we find other ways to um, make use of rice itself. One of the things that's really interesting is rice is such a, essential grain to Japanese culture and their identity. And it's the same thing with ulu and kalu, kalo. So not to have it is um, you kind of lose more of your identity and culture. And maybe uh, Donna, you can talk a little bit about how that goes hand in hand with economic vitality for a community. Well, um, unfortunately, I think Ulu and Kalo have um, largely been lost from what most people's regular diets are on a right. you know per capita basis. Ulu more than Kalo, I think Kalo has been retained more. Um, but with that loss comes loss of stories and history. Um, and especially in the case of our native Hawaiian population, loss of health. Um, you know, studies have shown that um, Ulu, eating ulu can help reverse diet-related diseases like type 2 diabetes and obesity, which afflict our Native Hawaiian population disproportionately. So, you know, there's all sorts of almost immeasurable things that get lost when these cultural foods are. So do you want to introduce one more question or can I? <laughs> I think we're, yeah, go okay. ahead, Kaho. Because uh, I really want to have one more question about the pandemic. So the COVID is obviously affecting everybody's life and it's changing everybody's life. 
um, both in Hawaii and Japan. What do you think what would be the new normal uh, after the COVID? I don't know it's called with COVID or after COVID. I think uh, even the vaccine is going to be made and distributed. We have to you know, deal with this kind of virus for a while. What, what, would, what do you think in the future is going to be like in, in your business? Maybe they know you first. <laughs> sure. um, I think that um, for starters, our um, e-commerce and you know direct-to-consumer efforts are probably only going to grow. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have gotten used to buying online. For us, we've had to educate consumers about um, buying frozen food online, which is really um, unfamiliar to most people. Um, but we've partnered. We're now actually a distributor for an eco-friendly. Um, shipping box insulation company <laughs> based in North Carolina. And now we distribute to other companies here in Hawaii. Um, so that's something that I think will probably be a shift in consumer behavior beyond the pandemic. How about you, Lina? Um, what do you think, what would be the new normal in Japan and your business? Um, not sure, quite sure, but I have a feeling that um, in Japan, people may go back <laughs> to, before, I don't know. I have, it's not, it's not that I want it, but I have a slight feeling that, that people may quickly go back. <laughs> but in, um, no feeling, um, I'm maybe hoping that people started to talk more about like the climate change or, you know, um, um, some people, we don't really know 100%, but, um, in Japan, um, it's not just this COVID pandemic, but we had lots of uh, typhoons and uh, the events that we started to feel the, the climate, it's changing now. So um, I have a feeling that that may give some impact to the people's mind when they purchase things. And, and also, um, after this pandemic, um, during this pandemic, um, I feel the people's desperate desire for um, the communication. And, you know, um, for we, we were doing lots of like community tours before, but we cannot do it now. But um, we keep feeling that, oh, when this is over, we want to visit you so much and we want to meet you and we want to go see the, the place and community. So when the world is open again, <laughs> with um, better like solution to keep this social distancing, but still we hope that we can invite people to our lo local community. And I think it will be the same in Hawaii too. I want to go to Hawaii too so much, so. <laughs> <laughs> So um, do you have a question from audience now? Well, I think in the uh, pandemic to maybe ending on a positive note, is there consumer behavior and awareness that might be positive in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think we touched on it already. Yeah. But, um, just that recognition that um, our economy um, has been really fragile. And um, it could have been any number of things that sort of caused this massive shock to our economy. Um, in this case, it was a pandemic. But there's a lot of things we can do to build resilience and to strengthen um, our ability to adapt in the face of change that maybe we haven't been investing in so much in the past few decades, and now we can. Um, so I would say that's a good one. Yeah. Thanks. Lena? 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 Effect, and there's something we learn in addition to the, the importance of communication. Sorry, I couldn't hear it. that. Do you think there's a, um, another positive effect or something that we learned from experiencing the pandemic in addition to the how important the communication is. Can you think of other 
positive effect. Mm -mm. Um, the, the communication and also the, the adore for nature, um, you know, because we can't travel, we, I miss so much to um, my like rice field or like the mountains and it's not just people that I miss, but it's that nature and the beautiful thing that we cannot see in Tokyo. So to be able to notice how much it's important for us, um, I think that was some of the, the positive um, thing that we noticed. Nature in Japan. <laughs> I miss Japan a lot. <laughs> And, and also so, the importance of learning um, to be like, to calm yourself and to look at the data and, you know, don't panic too much. And I thought it's really important that we check the news and we see and learn and have that, that understanding. So um, I think this year we really realized the need to like for studying <laughs> and learning. That was my finding. So Melanie, do you yeah. know we are celebrating women's entrepreneurs? Yay! Yeah, <laughs> we, are, we, we are happy to celebrate women entrepreneurs. And one thing I wanted to share is that um, I think women probably on a consumer level um, make 80% of the purchasing decisions. So part of the discussion we're having here tonight is to harness that power for positive impact. Um, and I wanted to ask both Donna and Lena, if sort of being a woman entrepreneur, do you feel it gave you a leg up or a slightly different perspective maybe than your male counterparts? I would say a different perspective for sure. Uh, I mean, I think the whole way that you know, I as a woman approach business is really different than um, a, a man in my position. Um, people also respond differently. Like I get asked a lot with new customers or project partners, like who they can talk to that makes the decisions. Oh, really? Yep, that happens almost every time I have like a new conversation with a, a new B2B customer or contractor or something. Um, which I've totally gotten used to. It's fine. I just say, nope, I'm the decision maker. <laughs> um, I've also had them assume that um, other employees in the company that work under me that are male are my boss. That's another pretty common one. Wow, this is 2020. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's true. Um, there's still a lot of conservative thinking, especially when everybody else in, in the room is, is male. Um, so I think that's a reality. Um, I don't know that the fact that women do most of the purchasing for the household has made um, our business stronger because I'm a woman, because I'm not necessarily the face of the company. You know, we are a co-op now of 100 farmers um, who are both male and women, all walks of life, uh, both men and women. Um, but, you know, it certainly gives us um, on our marketing team, which is pretty much all female, um, a certain perspective in our marketing efforts. You know, right. we're sort of marketing to people like us, to moms, um, to women with, with female preferences. So maybe on that level, it's a little bit of an advantage. Um, but I don't think that we necessarily get more business because the woman is a manager. Yeah. Maybe it helps with product development. Maybe. Did, um, make, you know, I thought it was such a genius idea to do the par cooked, peeled, frozen ulu. Can you give us a little insight on how that product came to be? Honestly, um, we first, I think, saw the product um, through John Cadman, the owner of Pono Pies, the oh, yeah. electric company. Um, he makes a product like that for his own use, for his value-added products, just to store ulu in season. Um, because it has such a short shelf life, it's so seasonal. You get an overabundance of ulu usually in season and then nothing for like six months. So he was doing it for himself and he showed it to us and we actually invited him over to come help us learn how. And that was in 2015, probably right after we started our farm. 
Um, and so when we formed the co-op about a year later, that was sort of the foundational product that we, we thought had a lot of market potential. And it was just a need, like in order to get Ulu into the food system again, you had to make it easier to use. Um, right. You know, you had to make it more convenient and available year round reliably. How did the chocolate mousse, which is a really amazing non-dairy product, come about? <laughs> that was the first thing I had of the co-ops product. And oh, nice. Yeah. Um, you know, again, it, it came from having, we had a ton of ripe ulu because we didn't want anything to go to waste. So we were steaming and freezing ripe fruit as we were doing mature fruit, but there was no demand from, at the time we were selling mostly to restaurants. They didn't want it. And so we needed to find something to do with it. And that was a base recipe that one of our co-op members came up with. And um, we made it in my kitchen one day. And then I, you know, we tweaked it a bit from there and it's evolved into what it is today. Yeah. How hard was it? You talked about one of the challenges in um, being in an island community and in Hawaii is a manufacturing side where there isn't someone that you can say 20 miles away here, can you take this part of our product and turn it into something? Mm -hmm. How did you set up that process on the big island? You mean our own production? Right, and what was sort of the challenge there and what, what know, did it take to get going? Honestly, community partnerships. Um, we were super fortunate. Um, one of our found one of our nine founding farmers had a commercial kitchen in a cafe that was the co-op's incubation kitchen for the first season we formed the co-op and she just opened our doors to, to us and that was sweet cane cafe in kilo and at the same time the hawaii food basket which is the food bank on hawaii island gave us freezer storage space because at the time i think we processed like five or six thousand pounds and we thought it was a ton at the time and <laughs> We had no place to store it, um, so they really helped us out. And then we um, also, through them, actually connected to our current um, headquarters in South Kona, which is an agricultural hub facility, a commercial ag hub that is owned by the state. It was built by the state in the early 90s and unfortunately sat vacant for a number of years and then became the Food Baskets West Hawaii Island distribution site. And they finally got their own site in Kona and moved out and sort of shepherded us in. Um, and that's a critical resource. And I think that there needs to be probably a lot more um, attention paid and, and investment put into these state owned commercial facilities because without them, it's so hard for farmers to value add right. and aggregate and store and just get their products to market. So we're a very lucky beneficiary of um, a lot of external support. How about you, Lynette? Um, I believe that most of your consumers are women, right? Do you think um, as an Ulu entrepreneur, uh, it's kind of a good benefit for you to do marketing, product development, all the aspects of a business to sell your consumer? Or do you have any, um, uh, you have a lot of male consumer too? Yeah, actually, um, maybe your Hi, um, you know, we do both B2B business and B2C business. And um, so maybe I have a feeling that our consumers may maybe half male, half woman, but um, not just that our business itself maybe never um, became a business if I were a man because um, you know, I think we are the first company that added value to um, alcohol, you know, being sustainable, you know, that alcohol ethanol that has all the background stories and um, like organic and stuff. Nobody wanted alcohol to be traceable before. And, you know, um, how I came up with this business was um, first, you know, we were thinking of using for biofuel and um we, we've been doing this for over 10 years and 10 years ago there were many many people and um like the the big companies like listed companies they were putting lots of money getting government fund doing the r d for making biofuel from waste or like um even rice too and there were many 
really big factory making alcohol for biofuel. So there are lots of competitors, but now they're all gone. It's zero. We are the only one who's been still doing this business so small. And many people um, that who are doing the business come to me now saying, when you first started, we thought you're not going to succeed. We thought you're going to fail because it's too small. And, you know, if you do small, the, the price, you know, the production cost will be too high. But, and everybody says that we never thought about the idea to add value to the alcohol itself. And we should have done that, that kind of thing that they always say. And it's all men. It's, um, I, so, you know, men or other like ex-competitors where they were so focused on making biofuel, they didn't realize that alcohol was also being used for like cosmetics and maybe, you know, the industry is so different. They even didn't know that there is a, the industry called organic cosmetics. And because maybe I was female and had friends like who was cosmetic fleek, my friends told me that if you're making alcohol, you know, there is a, that, the, the business sector called organic cosmetic, like organic foods, and you should go to the trade show and tell if there's a market. So that's how we came up with this idea to add value. So being woman maybe gave me the different perspective which resulted in doing our business right now. And when it comes to our current business, myself being woman, maybe it's not helping much. I'm not really good at doing marketing and doing the sales. So, and actually for cosmetics and beauty, most of the, the players are men maybe. So right now, I, I don't think I'm, using the good i'm using um myself for better for marketing but that's how we i assume doing. the b2c business is more targeted women consumer but when you do b2b you have to talk to mostly men have you ever um like kind of maybe it's a weird question but it's, have you ever heard of like feel frustrated like you selling the product to women through men, and then you have you ever feel there's a huge gap between consumer and the businessman middle, you and then the direct consumer? Um, no, for cosmetics, no, really, maybe, maybe I don't, maybe, maybe it's just, I don't know, but I have a, I always feel weird that, you know, though most of the clients were women, how come there's only men? <laughs> it's, I think it's just weird. And there are many women, but m many cases, it's the people who's doing sales at shops. But the people who make like the manufacturers and it's all men. And I think it's strange. So if, you know, if that changes, we might start to have better products, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so you think if you have more women, it will get better. It will be better. It, it may. I'm not surprised if that happens because it's simply strange and weird. Gina, we had a question from you from one of the viewers that wanted to know about community funding through slow money and how it works? Yeah, so um, thanks for the question. So we, um, as I said, have had to get pretty creative with our fundraising. And um, one avenue was indeed slow money, which is uh, community-based um, lending, um, mostly to food and agriculture businesses. And we um, initially got a slow money loan from about 10 different community lenders um, totaling about $30,000, so only, you know, $3,000 loan on average with um, very generous terms. Um, there is some interest, it is a loan, it's just in the local community. Um, and we used that to buy storage freezers um, when we were out of storage space. So that was super helpful. And then we actually did it again 
with a smaller cohort of our existing lenders um, to support cash flow during a time when we were, we had a lot of sales, but we weren't getting paid on time by customers. Um, so that's been super important for us. Um, also just the relationship building again, right. um, with different parts of the community. Um, and this, uh, early 2021, we're going to launch our first, um, stock offering for non-members, which we're very excited about. How would that work? Yeah. So co-op, the ownership structure of the co-op is that farmers can only buy, um, or I should say common voting stock can only be purchased by farmers. And it's one um, share of common voting stock or one share of common stock, one vote. So it's a democratic governance structure. Everyone has one vote, but there's also preferred stock. And we did our first preferred stock offering in, we actually launched it in March, which was not a good time, <laughs> but for, for farmers only. And we raised about forty thousand dollars just from within our farmer membership, um, which That's again fantastic. is used to capitalize the business. Um, and traditionally, that is how co-ops capitalize. It is right. to look into their own farmers. What's different about our co our Hawaii farmers is that they're small scale. They don't have a lot of money to invest. Right. Um, you know, typically these co-ops that have used that mechanism are large farms. You know, in the Midwest, for instance, growing corn or wheat or soybeans. Um, so for us, it, we don't have as much capital available that way, but we are able to offer preferred stock to non-members. It's non-voting stock. Um, and so we're going to give it a try and get even more creative. <laughs> and oh, that's our fantastic. Community. I just love the idea that both of you, what you do really is a direct relationship with the community and it strengthens the community and um, it's not just, oh, here's a consumer product I'm buying. There's some thought and you feel um, the person behind it. Yeah. Um, and so I did want to ask, you know, usually when people are talking about entrepreneurs and startups, it's always about growth and how fast you're scaling and where your revenues come. What really would define success for both of you? Well, for me, um, a real goal and a success matrix is to wean the co-op off of outside funding um, and, and get it to the point where it is fully economically self-sustaining and profitable, paying dividends back to its growers, which right. in the co-op model is based on patronage. So it's the percentage of crops that you contribute to the co-op each year is your share of the profits. When that happens, I will feel really happy and I'll retire. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Liner? What is the success for you? Um, keep, for myself, you know, keep doing the things that we love. That's, that's basically <laughs> the success. But um, actually, for main station, it's being funded by venture capitals. And um, we are, as a startup, we are expected to grow and scale. And maybe, maybe they don't want to wait like 20, 30 years. But um, I'm taking this as our the greatest challenge. Um, be first being profitable and also um, achieving our mission. You know, we what we want to do is we make better use of the, the like waste or the things that's being deserted. So the out the amount of the rice paddy that we're using, or um, the amount of the like apple residue that we use. That's also, um, and also being um, zero waste, keep doing the same thing um, and achieving these all is our biggest challenge. But if we can um, achieve that and show people to globally that we can do both, we, I, I think that will be a success because, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and so many people have been telling that you're not going to make money. Your business model doesn't scale. I, I don't see your, you know, the, the story. That's something I, I was being told so many times. But I want to tell them that it's possible that, that we can we achieve both. So if we, I, we can keep up doing what we are doing now and also scale, that will be a success for us. Keep up doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Lena, you mentioned the government funds and supports. Um, as an entrepreneur or as a woman entrepreneur, what kind of support or um, the, from government community 
what kind of resources do you think you need more for more women entrepreneurs to be successful? Well, um, I mean, there are a lot of programs out there um, in the United States, um, some of which even um, prioritize um, minorities, including women. Women are considered um, socially disadvantaged from that perspective. Um, so I think that the resources are there. Sometimes hearing about them and knowing how to apply um, is the hard part. Um, the Kohala Center does a fabulous job of helping um, small farmers in particular and small businesses um, access those opportunities. Um, and of course, the more opportunities, the better, especially um, at the state level, which is really hard right now with COVID budget cuts, um, but I think that is a missing piece. You know, there's a bunch at the federal level and really a missing tier at the state level. Um, but I did want to add something to my previous answer, bouncing off of Lena, which is just that I just wanted to clarify. So the profitability is really an indicator that things are working, um, you know, that, that small farmers are viable, that they're able to work together effectively and that consumers are eating ulu again. So the profitability is the indicator that those things are in place. It's all working together. Yeah. How about you, Lina? Um, I know a little bit for, a little harder for Japanese women to be entrepreneur rather than in US, statistically. Uh, what, what, what do you think you need women entrepreneur in Japan needs more as a resource wise and then um, uh, support wise? Mm -mm. Um, something really interesting happened yesterday, and I was giving lecture to at the um, uh, like women entrepreneurship kind of event, and before that there was um the pe one guy from the government, and he told me that oh thank you so much for coming. You know one of the big issue about women entrepreneurs most of them don't want to scale, and if I hear that her her that like few months ago. I might have said, yeah, that's true. But I was really strong and really f felt upset <laughs> and told him that, that, no, that's not the case. It's it's just because they don't notice. They don't know if they want to scale or not. It's because there's not many cases that they see. Um, and, you know, because it's really applied to myself, my case, um, for about like seven, eight years, after I started my business, um, my company was more like a small scale company. And, but I realized that, that if I'm being small, I can't give, I cannot give any impact that I wanted to do. You know, the rice paddy feel it doesn't grow at all. And we're just doing the same thing over and over. And then um, I joined one of the women um, acceleration program and met some women who wanted to um, scale and told me that it's, it's, you can challenge, but somehow I was thinking because there are not many women, the cases that we can feel familiar. I was, I thought I was made to feel that I can't do that. But when I'm looking at men and there's like lots of, lots of boys club and they talk, they drink out, they, they talk all the time, you know, Oh, he just got IPO or, you know, uh, he got funded. And that kind of community make them feel that they can do that too. And I'm not saying all this story saying that you got to scale, but it's just the way to think. So I feel that, you know, there are lots of acceleration programs and the, the support, but they also, there's a uh, more, many more cases that, um, the role models that the women can feel that they can do that too. Not like you don't need to be like really superstar, but somebody who try can success. That kind of story we should see more. And I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, and we should introduce those cases uh, to the people in addition mm -hmm. to creating the cases. Yeah. Oh, how, what is your perspective on that? Because you are a young woman entrepreneur, you do business in Japan and Hawaii. Um, how do you feel? I mean, I don't know. I, I got so much th things to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese women going in Japan, especially I'm from Kyushu area, where is well known as 
I don't want to call it discriminating. Usually in my regions, usually women, we, we were told that women has to be step, step down. Like you have to walk three steps behind a man. That's like a kind of beauty for a woman. Um, so um, I had a little bit hard time. Um, I can't imagine you doing that. So <laughs> how did you, <laughs> how did well, it go when um, you were doing that? I really appreciate to my parents because they, I have two brothers, but and they never, this, they never discriminated me. Uh, they they gave me the same opportunity as my brother did. So I never feel that when I'm working, I'm actually discriminated by male people, but it's a little bit like more, I feel like it's more a little bit social problem versus the, mm -hmm. so you can be successful, you can work, but like a lot of male expect you to be a woman. So for example, um, I've been single for a long time and I never get married. So a lot of male, especially from my region, think that I'm working hard because I can't get married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So those social pressure on me is more harder than the actual working mm -hmm. situation. So I, I mean, um, we actually graduated from same university, International Christian University. It's it's it, the university is um, well, um, known as the very unique university, uh, very westernized, Americanized, and a lot of successful women uh, come from that university. So I um, I'm a little younger than her, so I cannot imagine how hard she was. Even like it's hard for me as a my generation, it might be harder for her to be an entrepreneur in her generation. So that's why I really respect her and, and admire her. We're glad to have this event tonight to share stories. And we're really thankful for Donna and Lena to um, provide some inspiration. We thank you. I, we had another question, uh, Dana, for you from Katie. She wanted to know how other entrepreneurs can access the slow, um, I'm slow money. Slow money. Um, I think you can go to their website. Um, I think it might be slowmoney.org. Um, but if Mary's on the call, she can type it into the chat box. And um, I think the application portal is through the website. Yeah. Um, and one other just thought about, you know, the uniqueness and challenges of being a woman entrepreneur. I think there's, I mean, there's a, there is for sure a kind of social pressure around the role of women in the family and in the household. Um, you know, I have two young kids and it's it's super hard to juggle the responsibilities. I mean, even if you're not trying to scale your business, it is so much work to be a business owner or a business manager, right? The amount of responsibility on you is enormous. And if you also have the majority of the family responsibilities on top of that, it's almost impossible. It's like you're always working um, and I think that, you know, investing in um, more childcare support, mm -hmm. if you live in your family that helps, that's a blessing. But if you don't, right. Um, so childcare, you know, preschool from a young age, having it be affordable after school care, those are all critical just to enable women to attempt to be entrepreneurs, much less to then succeed in it and take it all the way into a profitable business, which is a years long process, right? You don't become profitable in one or two years. Yeah. Speaking of working so hard and not having um, time, just speaking with so many farmers, the getting the ability to access capital and even having the time to do that when you're trying to run your farm, mm -hmm. um, do you think for small scale farmers, especially in Hawaii, that the, the co-op is probably not the best model, but a very important critical model to consider if we want to keep small scale farming viable? I, I certainly believe that. Yeah. I mean, and not just in Hawaii, you know, all over right. the world, you see co-ops proliferate in regions with a lot of small farmers because they need um, some structure, some formalized structure to work together in order to be profitable. Um, and in Hawaii, it's really untapped. There's not that many co-ops. So I think that the time is ripe for that. Um, and I'm actually curious, Lena, I was wanting to ask what your relationship is with your growers, if 
it's just sort of like a purchase contract or if um, you're like part owners um, and if you considered the cooperative model in Japan for your business. Thank you. Um, in Japan, there's a really strict rules and regulation about having the, the family land. So, and it's even difficult for the business to do agriculture still. So um, right now we have a really good partner, the, the rice group. It's, I think it's like hope um, the, the farmers who have the group and the group is making uh, rice for us. And um, the reason the rice farmers have co-op is um, because, you know, before a long time ago, um, each rice farmers used to have the, their, his or her own uh, land and they have their own equipment, machines, and, but it's, it's, it costs so much, you know. Oh, thanks. Yeah. You know, the harvesters and stuff, they, it's really expensive. And also uh, most of the, the rice farm run in Japan, it's really small. So it was not efficient. And as not, and you know, it's, it sounds silly, but the, the, the owner of the small farmland, everybody had their own machine like this that they use only like a day a year. And also the number of rice farmers started to decrease. So about like um, 10, from about 10 years ago, people started to make the organization and the, the local people get together and share the farmland and do all the, the works together. So that's, um, that's how it, it works. That's really interesting. So your company actually sort of works with the co-op of farmers. Mm, yes, yes. And we, I don't think we will be part of the, the agricultural business from now on as well. It's, it's for us, it's too much. <laughs> so the agriculture partner should be done by our good farm farmer partners and our role is to to get them buy them and make them into alcohol so it's basically we work together but um our case it's it's not just we buy the rice that they grow but we um asking them to have our own dedicated um rice patty you know um we are asking them to keep the place for us just for us so that we can be sure that uh, our alcohol is coming from this area, this field, to be 100% traceable. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rima. I guess it's a good place to end as we're talking about partnerships and ways to work together. Um, again, and we, I hope that part of what we're doing here today, we're able to build um, maybe sharing resources and ideas with Hawaii and Japan, something that Takaho does um, with her company. I want to really thank the Consul General Aoki for his support of this event, which would not have been possible without them. Um, I know a lot of you ordered dinner and we thank uh, Chef Michelle Carr from MW Restaurant. Um, we say bye to Katie, thanks for joining and kicking us off and want to thank the box jelly. It's kind of cool. Everyone asked when they came in here today, wow, what is this space? So we're glad that we, I think, got to do the first live stream um, from their space. And um, I want to say goodbye and thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.